I do think taxidermy appeals to people perhaps who don't have any time for conceptual art and they like to see the work that's gone into it and, and maybe just to be reassured that it, they couldn't do that themselves. I mean, I like to think my work kind of combines both of those. It can be, it can be conceptual and have that, that, that craft too. I'm just looking for something specific right now. This is a gannet. A lady in Liverpool sent me. She found it on the beach. with when I first began doing taxidermy I was so overawed by the animals themselves that I would get inspiration from just looking at a bird or something and it was a much more instinctive thing so I would I'd walk around with a say with a bird and I'd put it on things and in things and I'd sort of just see the way it moved and the colors and I'd sort of just kind of I'd, I'd handle it for a day or something I suppose and start to kind of get a feel for how I think it might look good or, or what, what elements I could juxtapose it with to make it, to sort of bring out the beauty in it. This piece I'm going to make will be a scrunched up bit of paper, so like the kind of discarding of an idea. I'm going to cast the paper in, I think, in plaster or jesmonite, so it'll look like a ball of paper, and it's going to have a broken pencil, again, something that you do when you're, you're maddened by your inability to work. Um, a broken pencil, but in the shape of a lightning bolt, so it's going to come out of this scrunched up bit of paper, which will represent the cloud the cloud hanging over everything, which is sort of how I've been feeling lately. Every time I think of something, the next day I'll wake up and decide it's not good enough. So I've had this kind of cloud hanging over me, and that's going to be represented with a scrunched up ball of paper. And then the lightning flash will be made of a broken pencil, and it's going to be penetrating the breast of the bird. I'm actually thinking now, though, putting this bird next to these, I'm wondering if the bird may be a little bit too big for this piece. I might have to try and find something a bit smaller. Oh, there it is. I wonder whether this might be a slightly better bird. This is a minor bird. I'm going to go and look at this now. Might be a little smaller. Yeah, great. I'm going to use this one. So tell me why that pleases you more. It's just a slightly better size than the other one. It, this one, it, to me, just looks a little bit too big. It's only a fractional difference, but it makes it just it changes things for me. It's all about balance, really. When I'm making stuff, I, everything it's a difficult thing to explain, but everything just needs to balance, right? And I feel like that does. One of my first works, right in the beginning, I was just walking around my flat in my studio with this dead rat. It was a very fleshy, very floppy thing. I really like these old-fashioned champagne glasses and I bought one from an antique shop and I put it inside and it fitted so nicely it sort of spilled out slightly on the edges and it looked like this sort of scoop of fairy ice cream and there was something very sort of surrealist about it and it just looked really beautiful and I really, I, that, it was that thing I talk about with balance, it just sort of balanced 
and it was bought by Vanessa Branson. I installed it at her house next to a Grayson Perry vase and I just sort of thought, like, what the, you know, this is crazy. I couldn't quite believe that someone who bought things like that was buying my work. So I'm basically disconnecting the top layer of skin with all the um, feathers rooted in from the body, um, which I do by making small cuts and sort of peeling it with my fingers. I think taxidermy has for a long time been about the display of the animal and that's it really and everything else has been secondary to that so the taxidermist would create little kind of worlds and cases and where they'd mimic the natural environment of the animal um, and I've never sought to do that in my work at all um, the, the animals, I suppose, have been used more to convey an idea or a, an atmosphere or uh, to create humour, you know, for a number of reasons, but not my, mo my sort of modus operandi has never been just to show the animal as it is in life. to make sure the balloon actually sits straight because sometimes it needs a bit of tweaking. I, I've always wanted to bring taxidermy up to date, I suppose, and almost get away, even though I use the, the domes and everything, I've kind of wanted to get away from the Victoriana that it's associated with and make it sort of more modern and more sort of pop, I suppose, and I, I found that obviously the balloon is, is a very sort of pop image. And I thought there was something very sort of poignant and touching really about the the sight of this this little bird that had never matured going up in a balloon <laughs> there's something sort of womb like about the balloon and the string and the umbilical cord and I couldn't really get away from from what it reminded me of um, well very often when people look at my work certainly if they're just sort of not thinking deeply about it, they think it's about death because I've used a dead animal. But I would say to that that, you know, a charcoal drawing isn't about dead because it's made out of dead wood, dead burnt wood. You know, I think that it's, it is a material like any other and I think it can be used to convey all kinds of um, meanings really and it's very literal to look at it and just assume that the, the artist is is talking about death. Sometimes I am. I'm not saying that I don't in my work. It does happen, but that's not that's not the only thing. And mostly, actually, I think my work's more about life and about the sort of triumph of life on over death. And uh, I did a piece of work a few years ago, which was a coffin that was sort of splitting open. It looked really rotten and decrepit, and it had hundreds of tiny, tiny little quail chicks bursting from from within with their beaks open like they wanted to feed. It really kind of overwhelmed me, the sight of them all together. I'd been making all these heads and, and bodies and, uh, for ages, just sitting around, like, doing the same thing every day for months. And suddenly, just seeing them all like that, on top of each other and around each other, they suddenly had the impact that I'd hoped they'd have. I think just chicks trying to feed, I, I find, personally, quite a kind of shocking and alarming image. Any suckling, Babies, really, they, they, they are like parasites, really, and that's, that's all they, they do. They're just Chicks are just mouths, really. There's very little more to them than the mouth. The mouth is really oversized in relation to the body, and that's all they're about at that point. And there's something very frenzied and, and terrifying about that sort of need to, to be fed. The terror really lies in life, not in, in death, because Death is, is a peaceful state, ultimately. 
but it's the actual life and the fight for life and the fight to stay alive, which is actually more scary to me. The show that I made this fall was called Endless Plains, which is the English translation of Serengeti, which was a place I visited a year or so ago now. Inside the, what looks like the rib cage of the stag um, are hundreds of little bats hanging on the ribs asleep. Um, and I've concealed mirrors inside the stag either end so that it looks like it goes on endlessly. I came up with the idea of um, bats sleeping on the inside of there because it's something very peaceful. But at the same time, there's this sort of potential about bats sleeping. You know that at any minute they could all just sort of come at you. I like the sort of idea of the uncanny and of that sort of doing a double take on something where you, it, when your mind plays tricks with you and you sort of, I don't know, you, you think something is something else or that weird thing that happens in dreams when you're talking to someone and then suddenly there's someone else and you don't even question it. And I suppose just to create something that feels familiar to you somehow, even though it doesn't exist, is quite pleasing. Hiya. Hi. Right. Yeah. How are you? Have you got my squirrel? Yes, I have. Not defrosting, hopefully. There you go. Thank She's you. quite a big one. Clawing her way out of the bag. Yeah, I know. Wow, oh, she's quite big. Yeah, she's pretty oh, big, but she's wow. in good condition. Very good yeah, kind condition. Kind of stunned pose. She just had a heart attack on the pavement. I don't know pavement. where she found it. I think it was just outside this girl's house, wasn't it? Yeah. Is that your role then, picking up dead animals? One yes, of his roles. Yeah. One of my many roles, yeah. <laughs> delivery, special delivery. More special than the Royal Mail. I had to check when I was when um, doing interviews for the job, I had to check that the, the people were comfortable handling dead animals. It's true. I'm and not sure my there. climates appreciated it in the uh, freezer last night, I've got <laughs> my vegan flatmates. <laughs> I decided early on that I wanted to work only with animals that had died natural or unpreventable deaths. Someone sent me a sort of exotic chicken once, which was very odd looking. I couldn't work out what it was for quite a while because it was frozen in a strange position. Um, she's a friend of mine and she's funny. She just, she, she keeps animals and she lives in the country and she's terrible at warning me. So she'll just send me like a pet, the, the, her child's pet rabbit will suddenly arrive in the post one day. Fortunately, I seem to always be in when they arrive, but occasionally. Uh, there's a guy who sends me bags of budgies. He breeds budgies and he, he seems to lose a lot of budgies but um, he'll save them over time. And suddenly just post me a massive box of budgies out of the blue, and I have missed his post a few times and had to go and pick up a load of rocky birds from the post office. I try to say yes to everything I'm offered, really, because I never know what I'm going to come up with next and what I'm going to need. And in the past, I've turned things down, and then a couple of weeks later, suddenly thought of something that involved that animal and kicked myself. So as long as there's freezer space for it, I take it. This was a totally unexpected present from a friend a couple of months ago for my birthday. She turned up for dinner um, in a posh restaurant. With